Welcome to Atlanta History Center's virtual author talk series. My name is Claire Haley. I am the Vice President of Public Relations and Programs for Atlanta History Center. It's absolutely my pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's conversation with Art Dunning. Uh, we're so happy that y'all switched to the virtual format at such short notice. We really appreciate it. As you know, all of the winter weather we've been having in the South, uh, which we're not always the best prepared for, um, meant that Art wasn't able to make it to Atlanta, but we're just grateful that he's able, has internet <laughs> and power and is able to get on with us virtually tonight and that all of you uh, were amenable to making the switch at such short notice, so thank you. Tonight's program is being recorded. It will be made available on YouTube afterwards as well as AIB Network. Um, so if you want to share it with a friend or family member or watch it again, you'll be able to do that. Art will be talking about his um, book that came out, I believe last year, it's called Unreconciled, Race, History and Higher Education in the Deep South. If you haven't read it yet, I highly encourage you to read it. I think by the end of tonight's conversation, know that there's so much more than we'll even be able to scratch the surface of um, in this talk in that book. So highly encourage you to pick up a copy my colleague Monique put a link to do so in the chat. That um, is a link to our museum shop and is 25% off for tonight only. So please get your copy from Atlanta History Center if you haven't already and definitely read the book. I'm going to briefly introduce, introduce tonight's speaker and then turn it over uh, to our moderator this evening and over to Art. Arthur Dunning is a veteran administrator, scholar, and lecturer with a distinguished track record in higher education in Alabama and Georgia, including service as vice chancellor for international programs and outreach for the University of Alabama system, vice, senior vice chancellor of human and external resources with the University System of Georgia, vice president for public service and outreach at the University of Georgia, and president of Albany State University. So he's just about done it all in higher education that there is to do in the Southeast. I'm really excited for you to hear from him this evening. He will be in conversation with Atlanta History Center's president and CEO, Sheffield Hale. Uh, Sheffield's been at the History Center for almost 10 years. That anniversary is coming up in March. Prior to that, he was a corporate lawyer, so he's still recovering. And he was a graduate of the University of Georgia, of course, part of the University System of Georgia. So Sheffield and Art, thank you both so much for being with us this afternoon. Well, thank you, Claire. And uh, I think the thing to do is this, this book is... Is, is one of the best books I, I've read in a long time. And there's so much in it that is, um, is impactful for me personally. Um, but I, what I thought would be great would be for Art, if you could start to talk a little bit about your journey and your book, and then we'll uh, follow up with some questions okay. as they come out. Sheffield, thank you very much. And I appreciate uh, you asking me to do this. One of the things I thought about when I left the position in Albany, I remember reading something that Adams said to Jefferson, and I'll paraphrase, that before we die, we ought to explain ourselves to each other. And so much has happened in my life, coming of age in Southwest Alabama, coming of age in this country abroad, as well as uh, moving around in positions in higher education. And I tried to think about how to talk about it in ways where a person who had no experience in any of this could understand. And what sort of pushed me to really take the time to do this is where we are as a nation. I grew up in a, in a place in Southwest Alabama, part of the plantation agriculture section of Alabama is uh, located in a very poor state and the poorest section of a poor state. That's where the Alabama Black Belt is. My family has been there since the 1850s. And so as I thought about all of this at retirement and my final job at Albany State where we were consolidating a historically white campus and a historically black campus, is what struck me is how deep divisions are in this nation and sort of the, how did this all begin? And I tried to think of ways to write about it and to think about it and, and give myself as well as others a view of the future, what we can do in a very different way. Growing up, growing up in the Alabama Black Belt, I spent the first 18 years on a Jim Crow system 
But it was not just laws, but it was policy, practices, and customs. And backed up by a system of uh, what I call a racial caste system and enforced by violence and terrorism. That was what was going on at the time. In so many ways, we have a lot of mythology in our country, but we moved away from empirical evidence and moved away from, in many ways, telling the truth. So I thought about mythology versus facts, that what I knew and what I'd experienced, I've talked to a lot of colleagues over the years and not many would have any idea of what I saw as a child and what I experienced as a child. So I thought I'd write about the Alabama Black Belt. It started out just sort of putting these words on paper, but it moved very quickly into some of the political, economic, and social context of this nation, the journey uh, that I've taken. I spent a lot of time in East Asia. I spent two years in Taiwan and two years in Thailand. The first two years was in the military and the second two years I had a bachelor's and a master's degree from the University of Alabama. So I got a chance to see Asia uh, through two different viewpoints. The reason I talk about this and, and explain that time in Asia, because it's just to juxtapose against the Alabama Black Belt, which is a very remote area where I was coming of age, about 246 people in my little small town, but ended up in Taipei and Tainan and Bangkok, mega cities. And so I write about my time out of the country, how I could see this place in a very different way. I was out of the country in 1963, the entire year. And the way I have thought about it over the years is I've used the approach that James Baldwin used. Many African-Americans went to France in the 20s and 30s. Baldwin went there in 1948. To Paris. And his desire was to get out of this country. He needed, he said, to breathe. And when I decided to go into the military, my dad did not want me to do that. He wanted me to go to Tuskegee first, join the ROTC and go in after you finish college. But I had this fear that if I were not called on active duty, I might end up back down in Marengo County being a school teacher. So I thought, don't want to do that. But the Baldwin point of view where he could look at this nation from the outside uh, sort of struck a chord with me because I want to talk a little bit about the time I was out in 63. He went back to Baldwin, went back to Istanbul, went to Istanbul in 1967 uh, to finish up another country in the fire next time. And he again went into great detail about looking at America from the outside. So when I spent time in Taiwan, a couple of things happened. The first was the Kelly Ingram Park in Birmingham, Alabama. And I had become friends with a Taiwanese businessman who had a business right outside of the American compound. And he asked me a lot of questions, but the first thing he asked me about that he saw in this newspaper in Tainan was the Kelly Ingram Park in May, and that was where Bull Khan and others turned the police dogs and fire hoses on the students in Birmingham. He said, what is this about? Because on that front page of the newspaper, he, it was all in Chinese, Mandarin. And he asked about nonviolence. He asked about civil disobedience. And I explained to him about Gandhi's approach to asking the British to go home. I explained Henry David Thoreau, civil disobedience, and Martin Luther King using that same process, heavily in symbolism and heavily around disobeying unjust laws. And the way we became friends, this uh, Taiwanese businessman, he had an abacus calculator. And we, he, I asked him to teach me how to use it. So he was doing that. In the meantime, he had heard an American say it's raining cats and dogs outside. He said, what in the world does that mean? And I said, that's an, an English idiom. And so he got in, interested in idioms. And so through the abacus and talking about idioms, we became very good friends over time. But he read about the Kelly Ingram Park. And so I was able to talk about the sort of Jim Crow system in the South and what that meant. And he said, who is Jim Crow? And I said, Jim Crow came from 
an itinerant white actor in the 1830s that showed an African-American man as a buffoon dancing and singing and being somewhat illiterate. I say it was to, it was to show, it was to dehumanize. It was to dehumanize a group and a race of people. So, that, but somehow in the 1880s, Jim Crow got tied to these system of laws. I say it wasn't just laws, it was policies, practices, perspectives, values, the whole system. And so it was complicated to explain. And the reason I thought about this is how I was out of the country reading about the same thing he was reading, but I was going to the base library. So the first time I've been able to go to a library is on foreign soil because I couldn't go to the library in London, Alabama. But I, I was reading Look, Life, New York Times, Washington Post, and they had only one Southern newspaper. It was the Atlanta Constitution. So I was reading Ralph McGill and all these things that were going on back in the country. So I was in a position to learn what was happening back in the States, but also having to transmit that to a native of that island. The second thing that he asked me about is when uh, Kennedy made a speech on civil rights, that was in the Taiwanese newspaper. That was the night after George Wallace stood in the door at the University of Alabama in Foss Auditorium. And as I remembered that, I never would have imagined that 36 months later, I would be in that same auditorium as a Vietnam era veteran going to school at the University of Alabama. So he asked me to, to talk a little bit about why would a sitting chief executive block students from learning? So I had to sort of walk through the, the racial caste system of inferiority, superiority, and hereditary advantage. Those things were complicated for me to talk about because I never had a need to explain it. And as we talked through that, the next time I saw him, he asked about Medgar Evers, who had been shot that night after Kennedy made his civil rights speech. And Evers, he said, what did he do? What, why did he get shot? I said, he, he was committing something that people thought was inappropriate, and that was to help people register to vote in Mississippi. So he was shot for, his, for, what, for what he was doing. So we talked through that. And then uh, after June, King made his I Have a Dream speech, one of the major speeches of the 20th century. But he, one of the things he picked up on, this notion of content of our character, ending Jim Crow and equality under the law. So I, I explained to him about equality under the law, ending Jim Crow, and how the content of our character, what that means. I tried to explain that in the, in the United States, especially under the Jim Crow system, you are born and you're part of a race and you're either viewed as inferior or superior and nothing you can do to change that. I said an African-American man with a PhD falls in the same category as a person who, who cleans the grocery stores in London, Alabama. We're viewed as a monolithic group. And he said, why did Dr. King use the Bible so much? I said, the Bible is the most sacred text in Western civilization. And li living in a country at the time, which was, had Buddhism, uh, so I had kind of walked through some of the Western civilization and religion uh, values and beliefs. And the last thing <clears throat> I want to mention is that in November, 1963, I was, I worked a midnight shift in, in a nuclear weapons area. They turned in an M, uh, M2 carbine and a pistol. So I was in the bed, go, sleep. And a Taiwanese young boy who kept our barracks clean, we paid him some money to do that, all 30 of us. He touched me on the shoulder and said, the American, he's, no, he said, the president has been shot. I thought he meant the president of the Republic of China because in 48, Mao had chased Chiang Kai-shek out of the mainland. So he had taken up residency in Taipei. <clears throat> and he said, no, 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 the American president has been shot. And I immediately got out of the bed and walked out in the hallway. There were two, two airmen. One was from Morrow, Georgia, and the other was from Huntsville, Alabama. 
They were screaming and yelling, celebrating Kennedy's assassination. They said, we got him. We got Kennedy. And it shocked me. Because what I couldn't figure out at the time, why were they celebrating the assassination of an American president who was the command in chief? And we, part, we were part of the U.S. Armed Forces on foreign soil. So what was aggravating these two young men from Mara, Georgia, and Huntsville, Alabama, was Kennedy's approach to civil rights. And they were happy and celebrating that he had been assassinated. And I went back and sat on my bunk as in 19 years old at the time. And that's when I realized, and I became very sober about how deep the fault line is that we have in this country for many of our citizens around freedom and flexibility for all of us. I, I lost any sort of innocence I had about this is going to be a simple process. But I knew when I came back home that I was not going to subject myself to Jim Crow laws. I did not know how this was going to happen, but I was not going to live the rest of my life because I had felt freedom and liberty in, in a foreign country. And so I finally realized what this feels like it, to be left alone, to go to libraries, to go to movies, to go to bookstores, to go all these places. And there are no colored and white signs. So I was shocked by that. And I thought, when I come back to the States, I'm not going back to the Jim Crow process. But what these two young men were celebrating, Jim Crow was what we needed. I'm on top and you on, on the bottom. So I, start, I thought about all that. And so all of this happened when I was away from the country. And I was a teenager. And, and the only time I got very down was when those four girls were killed in the 16th Street Baptist Church. Four were killed because dynamite was placed and one was blinded from glass. And what struck me, not just the death of those young girls, but they struck at an institution called the African-American church in the South. One of the first things slaves did when they became free was start a church. And I grew up in a community where I could see men having to take their hat off and say, yes, sir, no, sir, boss. And but on Sunday, they put on that one suit they had, that church clothes, and they became men. So that church in the South has a strong, not just a place of worship, but an institution of assertion, strength, and dignity. And four guys thought it would be okay to put dynamite outside that and kill those girls. Two weeks before that, there was a quote in the New York Times that George Wallace said, the way we'll stop all of this foolishness is to have a few more first-class funerals in the state of Alabama. And so what we've ex experienced, not just in 63, but today, what politicians allow us to help us to be our worst selves. And when I got on, was leaving Alabama, and I'll say this in, in Sheffield, and I'll stop and, and then respond to any questions you might have, is my dad dropped me off at a small town called Thomasville, Alabama. It was a real old railroad town. I had a duffel bag, Air Force duffel bag, in my uniform. And everything I owned was in that duffel bag. I was getting ready to catch a bus to Mobile and then get a train to California. Wallace was there, and Wallace had lost earlier to John Patterson. And Patterson was a, an arch segregationist, a real demagogue. And Wallace realized that that's what it's going to take to win. That's what I'll do, too. But before the bus drove up, I heard a portion of what Wallace said. And this is where... I, first got introduced to this notion of anti-intellectual and anti-science because my mom was a first grade teacher. <clears throat> my dad was a high school principal. I can't think of two people who had more passion about learning than those two. But Wallace said to about 75 working class whites standing out near a flatbed truck after a country western band had warmed up the crowd. And he said, I want to be your voice. Said, but let me tell you who's doing things to you. First of all, we have states' rights. Those Yankees trying to tell us what to do. 
but there are others. Let me tell you who they are. There's a man up in Montgomery named Frank Johnson. He's a lying scalawag of a federal judge. And so y'all need to know that he was my law school classmate, but he's worthless. There are some others who, uh, who, are not, who think they're better than you are and others who just want to tear up our system. They're hippies, they're communists, they're Jews and Yankees. And don't let me forget about those liberal college professors on these campuses. He said, they think they just as smart as you are. He said, but you know what? I trust the common voice and of the common man, man in Alabama. So this was political theater before social media, before cable. And when Wallace had a sense of humor, he went on a rant. Before he finished, there were a cheer started up. Give him hell, George, give him hell. And that was uh, on some of his bumper stickers. And the thing that I thought about over the years, there have been a few demagogues in the South who've just been skilled at what they do. Huey Long in Louisiana, Ross Barnett in Mississippi, George Wallace in Alabama, and Eugene Talmadge in Georgia. These are people who, who looked at the issue of race and said, our fellow citizens should be subjugated forever. They should, if we cannot enslave them, we can discriminate against them and we can segregate them. And what I have felt, and I saw this in my time in Georgia, we had no way to do what the South Africans did was to remediate the toxins in our environment. There are a lot of toxins in our environment. We saw it on January 6th. The anger shocked a lot of people, the rage, resentment, and anger. That's not going to solve the problems in a multi-religious, multi-racial, and multi-ethnic country, which is what we are. That won't be the solution. Don't know if we can do this, but I will submit to you generosity, compassion, and restraint may give us a chance, but the other, the rage, resentment, and anger, we don't stand a chance with that one. So that's sort of when I wrote this book, it was almost I needed to explain myself. I need to explain some of those things that I had seen over the years, and I would become so sober when I was down in Albany, Georgia, and watching and listening to people felt a lot of angst about change, especially around the issue of race. So, Chef, I'll stop at this point and respond to any questions. Well, uh, you know, one of the things that struck me when you're talking about being in Taiwan and, and, uh, and, and being and essentially translating a, a America to this Taiwanese businessman, you're doing a little bit of the same to us today, having stepped out of the country and having lived also all these years you know, there are a lot of people today that don't, like you, you said, don't understand what Jim Crow was about mm -hmm. and what the la lasting legacies of that are. Um, and so I, you know, one of the things you talk in the book are about the uh, emotional wounds of Jim Crow and the legacies of Jim Crow and, and, and how that still plays out today. And it played out in Albany with the merger, um, but it plays out every day. Do you have anything, what would you, what would you say about that? Oh, uh, the first time I think I was introduced to that, <clears throat> the emotional wounds, is when those girls were killed in the church in Birmingham and a lot of tension was, it was very palpable on that small air station. And between Air white airmen and African-American airmen, because what was happening back in the States caused tension over there. And we were only about 250. And our job was to, there were four aircraft with nuclear weapons on them. And to get those planes off the ground in 90 seconds to targets over China, the Cold War was raging. And I finally, I was, let me back up, because I was a voracious reader. So I was keeping up with everything going on back in the States, but I always kept a book going. Um, and so, my tension must have just become so overt. One day I, after we finished our eight hour shift and I turned my weapon in, this Hawaiian 
supervisor. He said, let's go for a walk. We walked down the flight line, airplanes taking off, jets taking off, Taiwanese fighter pilots taking off. We were walking, the two of us walking down. He said, you're walking around like you are lit fuse. He said, you can't solve everything back in the States. When you wear this uniform, you represent the United States of America abroad. Somehow, when you get back home, you're gonna to have to figure out how to navigate through everything that has happened and through the ongoing complexity that's there. And he was able to talk about this in a way where it reached me. And so I felt in hindsight, my anger and rage about the girls being killed had me held hostage, had me where logic, reason, analysis, and synthesis, and data, and facts getting somewhat submerged because I was so tied up in knots that people who were trying to get out of segregation, who were trying to live a life to be left alone, and they were blown up in a church. So that, that really struck me. And somebody at two or three nights later, I was on a two-person team with a, a guy from, uh, I think, Memphis, Tennessee, white guy. He said, well, what do you people want? I said, I, I think I'd just like to be left alone. And I saw years later that Gandhi, he was called by the British Viceroy when he was doing all of the civil disobedience and protesting. And the, and the Viceroy said, Mr. Gandhi, and he had four or five British officials around the table. What do you want from us? What do you want us to do? And Gandhi said, leave. What? He said, leave. Go back to Britain. And I thought about that when I told this guy that I was not asking, talking about reparations. I was not talking about an apology. Just let me compete. And so this whole idea of how... <clears throat> Many people are looking for someone to say, I regret this, I'm sorry about it. I'm disappointed that it happened. But accountability is something that seems not to be com coming. There's been no way to remediate those two phases. So what it has left is an undercurrent. It has left an undercurrent on all sides of grievance and anger and so that for me that was the emotional wound and so when hit when this guy from hawaii spoke with me about it I, as i think about my life i read so much as a child and it started with my dad reading night book nighttime stories i've always been a thinker i can't remember a time in my life when i didn't think about things and so i had to think about what he said to me that you're being controlled by some things. You're being controlled by your, your anger and your anger won't solve anything. My mother took the same approach. She looked at performance and achievement. Some of these things will take care of themselves over time, but they don't take the place of high performance and high achievement. So some of those things converged and those words didn't fall on deaf ears with me. But some of my colleagues at uh, on Taiwan, uh, his words that fall on deaf ears. So I've thought about that over the years as I've observed in complicated and complex organizations at the University System of Georgia, the University of Georgia, University of Alabama, my time in Bangkok, how those things in the past that are history and culture and feelings and emotions can hold you hostage. And as complex and complicated we are, even on our best days, if we're doing things together, there's still going to be hard challenges to solve, whether it's a pandemic, whether it's education, whether it's law enforcement, whether it's infrastructure. If we all agree, those are challenging problems. But when we put race and ethnicity into the process, they become almost insurmountable. And so the emotional wounds and now how we navigate through those is, is a significant thing because but Nelson Mandela said that we cannot manage South Africa 
if we have 30 million black South Africans, seven, eight million Africanas, if we don't have a way to, to come to grips with what happened, we don't have a way to charge you with the crime, but we have a way to tell the truth, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And in this country, I felt that we have not had any way. So some people, are, many are still looking for someone to own up to what happened. And others are saying, I had nothing to do with this, so don't bother me about it. So we had this sort of weird loggerheads. And very astute demagogues, they take advantage of our angst and pain and emotion around some of these issues. The demagogues are like they have been forever, um, been able to use these things. And as I start to think about what's going on in our country, I looked at Germany in the 30s, where the evolution to the end of war, when the end of World War II, where Germany was defeated, how those incremental steps led to losing uh, some national sense about what a country should be. And the thing, I'll say one more thing about that. I was talking with a woman from Berlin. I was in Berlin probably two, three years ago. And we were discussing something in, and she mentioned something about capital punishment. I said, do you have capital punishment? And she said, no. She said, after World War II, we don't trust ourselves to kill anybody. And she also mentioned to me, at the end of the war, entire villages, entire towns would take them through some of those camps. So townspeople who have been living next to those camps could see what went on in there. And so as you look at countries who've tried to deal with what happened in the past, whether South Africa or Germany, to say we can't move forward unless, some, unless there's some reconciliation. So I, w I think about that for us, and, and I don't know what, if you ask me what the answer is at this point in time, given how we are functioning and behaving, I don't know what that would be. Well, I mean, the way, the way, one of the things in, in your book that is so is striking is that it's essentially taking us through that village um, like you talked about in Germany, in terms of showing us what happened under Jim Crow in a granular way and what ha and how you were able to react to it in your life. Um, I mean, one of, one of your quotes was, before I went into the Air Force, I behaved as if I was a renter in this country. I came out of the military as an owner. And so you came back to take charge, like you said. Today, um, and then you were in the military in, in Montgomery, Alabama, when the end of the Montgomery, to um, the, the settlement of Montgomery March occurred and you went to see Martin Luther King. Could you, given the day today, could you uh, elaborate on that a little bit? What that was? It, it was in March 65. And one of the, I remember why this is so clear to me is that Martin Luther King was a unique person. He had the ability through his scholarship and his, his undergraduate degree at Morehouse and his PhD in religion. He had a, an easy range with the, the Judeo-Christian Judeo uh, heritage and issues of religion. It was just his range, he was very nimble and agile. So he could speak <clears throat> to people in so many different ways. But he also, in the what he got from his father and I guess grandfather, the sort of ability as a Baptist pe preacher in the South is to speak to people who had not been to school very long. So his range was from the person who was a domestic to the PhD or any other high-end area. So, so King could, could do that. And at the end of the settlement of Montgomery March, I remember on base, we had a <clears throat> people are, around us on the base would always caution us when we went in the town in Montgomery. And we've decided to make sure this 
supervisor knew we were going into town, about four or five of us, to go to St. Jude, which is a Catholic school and a Catholic complex for African Americans in, in Montgomery. And behind that was sort of a recreation field, large area. And they had set up a, a stage that night. And the only admonition we got from our supervisor at Maxwell Air Force Base is don't wear your uniform, wear civil, civil, civilian clothes. And, and so when I got there that night, some of the people I remember, Sammy Davis Jr., Harry Belafonte, Tony Bennett, Peter Paul and Mary, uh, Joan Baez, I think Nina Simone may have been there. But my Luther, they had a, it was sort of a celebration of the Selma and Montgomery March. They had started when they got past the Edmund Pettus Bridge and spent five or six days walking Highway 80 from Selma to Montgomery. And so that night, it was sort of a place of respite, the St. Jude field, and it was entertainment. It was fun. It was exciting. And they were able to sort of rest before they went down to the steps of the state capitol in the next day. And Martin Luther King did something that I thought was unique. And he started out sort of the, the symbolism of the march and the significance of the march and the significance of nonviolence, civil disobedience, and the reason and why this was happening. Again, he was looking at the end of a, of a legal system in the South called Jim Crow that was undergirded by a racial caste system of superiority versus inferiority. So he talked about that. He talked about petitioning the state and the governor and presenting the governor with a, sort of a, a righteous cause. And what struck me about him is as a Baptist preacher, I had grown up in a, in a church because in rural areas, churches were places of conversation and uh, visiting and socialization, not just worship. So I had been, I had heard a lot of Baptist preachers. But Martin Luther King was a unique Baptist preacher, an extremely bright man. And so he was able to be nimble and agile and be in a very scholarly way. But he also at times, interspersed his speech with something that people who were not well educated, uh, who had the same passion and feeling and emotion about his words. What I felt at the time, he was putting the layers back of almost 350 years, 250 years of slavery, 100 years of Jim Crow, and he was expressing the yearnings of a race of people who had had enough who had had enough dehumanization, had enough violence, had enough of a hereditary advantage, had enough of explanations for why I'm the servant and you're the master. And so he kind of talks about all that. And as, as he talked, you could almost hear the, the crowd and people talking. It got to almost a, a call and response that you see in many African-American churches where the preacher says something and, and people uh, respond. And so we stood there and uh, I listened to that. And I had no idea. I knew it was significant and I knew about the brutality of the South and I knew how to navigate as best I could to keep myself from being harmed because of my race. Um, but I had no idea of the significance over the next 50 years past that 1965, what was, what all this would mean. Because in 1964 civil rights, Alabama and, and, and many Southern politicians said, now, President Johnson, you've gotten this civil rights bill signed. Now you enforce it. Now you enforce it. Which was, you have passed it, but we're gonna resist. We're gonna, we're gonna resist as hard as we can. So I was under no illusions that when Johnson signed that, all of a sudden, people would behave in a very different way. So, and King speaking at that behind St. Jude it was almost as if he could touch the, the deepest feelings and emotions of the people who had been under the yoke of, of 
some system for 350 years in this nation, about 100 years of Jim Crow and about 250 years of slavery. And what was also clear that I don't think Wallace knew it, I don't think Bull Connor knew it, and I don't think any other Southern demagogue or politician knew it. But at that point, my sense was this is over. People are not going to continue to do this on the Jim Crow. A lot of folks have gotten killed in this process, but that's if that's what it takes to tear this up, but they were not going to live under that any longer. As a, I, think, I guess I was 21 at the time. I knew that was done because it was done for me. It was done for me when I came back to Taiwan. I did not know how this thing was going to end, but I was not going to be a young man, a middle-aged man and an elderly man, not looking people in the face and being left alone. I just, just knew that. So King was able to articulate all that. All right, all right so let me, <laughs> Fast forward through your life, okay? So from there, you go to essentially help integrate the University of Alabama, um, and you start helping integrate the, the football team. You have a great story about that. I may leave that for people to read the book. It's, all, it's, it's fabulous. Then you go and you deal with a lot of higher education in, in Georgia, and that's where I met you is when you were at the University of uh, Georgia, um, and I was involved over there. And then you end up at the end of, you get called back to do a merger between Albany State University in Albany, Georgia and, and Darton College, in, in which was one historically black institution, Albany State. And then the college was uh, formed in 1964 as a, was it, was it a two-year college? All right, two-year college. Two-year two college and to do the merger. And so one of the things you talk about it's really fascinating. A lot of this all comes together when you're going through all that merger and what that entails in Darty County, Alabama, in Darty County, Georgia, is uh, legacies of the Jim of Jim Crow that still reverberated when that merger occurred. And I was wondering, a, what those were, were and how you felt them, and then what your biggest surprises were from the standpoint of you being the president of the historically black college and, and leading the merger between the people who are the, the white residents of, of Darty County and Albany and, and then the African-American um, who were students or alumni of uh, Albany State. It's, in some sense, it wasn't amusing when I was in it, but it's amusing now since I'm out of it. When I was in it, the intensity almost on a daily basis was palpable. You could just feel it. <clears throat> when the merger was announced, I was, uh, Saturday morning, I went to get a haircut. And in a small town like Albany, if you're the president of Albany State, you, cannot, you couldn't go anywhere and be anonymous. So the a guy followed me out of the barbershop, African-American man. He said, Dr. Dunning, I just heard about this merger. You got your hands full. He said, I've been in Auburn all my life, but you're going to catch hell from a whole lot of people. I said, tell me what you mean. He said, uh, those White people downtown wanted to see Albany State closed in 1994 when the flood happened. They're going to do everything they can to uh, fight this merger. So they view Albany State as a place that's less than. They view it as a nothing but a cultural island, but no serious academics. Nothing goes on over there that's serious. So that's what the white folks think about this place. He said, now let's talk about us. He said, you got a lot of black folks over there at Albany State. They don't want to change one thing about that place. They want to stay as they are. It makes no difference about the merging that they might come out in a better place. So you have two unwilling partners. Neither one would like to participate in this. And they're both going to unload their feelings and emotions on you. And as he was talking, I was kind of Sheffield thinking about my place and time in London, Alabama, Sweetwater, Alabama, Marengo County, where well, I had seen the rawest of the Jim Crow lifestyle. 
And I thought, um, I think I can hear raw language about race. I didn't say that then, but I, I was thinking as, as he was talking. He says, well, Dr. Dunning, I don't envy you. You can have your hands full. So that was my sort of first shot across the bow about a citizen in Albany explaining to me what I would be up against. And when we started to uh, move around through the process, I was invited to Rotary. I was invited to Kiwanis. I was invited to a business group of all uh, white businessmen. And then there was a small group organized by a lawyer in Albany. He invited 10 people. These were sort of the, the gentry of Albany. And uh, the, on the economic side. So he, they said, uh, Dr. Dunning, we are here this morning. This is 8 o'clock in the morning. We'd like to kind of talk with you about this merger. And I said, how much time do we have? He said, we've set aside the morning. I said, uh, before we start, I always speak candid about things. You okay with that? He said, oh, oh absolutely. And so... I gave a, a, a view of what was going on and an overview of the process. And one of the business people, the Dr. Dunning, you do know we don't want any part of this consolidation and the merger. He said, by the way, what in the hell is an HBCU? Just what is that? So I had to explain to him that in 19, Higher Education Act 1965, that any university that's a, that really addressed the needs of predominantly black population before 1964 up to 1964 would be identified as an HBCU for funding purposes. And I named, I said, about 100. I said, in Georgia, you have Fort Valley State, Albany State, and Savannah State. And so I explained that prior to 1964, I said that all of the members of my family went to Alabama State and Tuskegee. They would have not have called them HBCUs at the time because they all went before 1964. I said, but that's what that is. And well, why do you think the chancellor did this to us? And I said, you know, we are living in the poorest section of Georgia. And we are, we have one of the lowest college participation rates in the country. We have out migration. So we're in a tough place. And we have used a lot of human capital around fighting with two campuses. And I don't know the chancellor's reasons for doing this, but I think he made a good decision. As I was in the system when we talked about it in the late eighties, I, th I said, if you really want to understand where I am, I think it should have been done then. We left you to your devices down here to continue an insane fight. It wasted this community's time and wasted your time. Well, you know this, this is gonna be a bad situation. I said, you know, it might be better if you support, if you can figure out a way to support it. <clears throat> so we spent time talking in that vein for about three hours. And went back to Albany State and the comments I got from a small group, a similar group and community group that said, Dr. Dunning, don't you let those white folks take our school. And what are you, what are you doing, Dr. Dunning? Uh, and that was back to sort of the, oh, we want to see you getting in the, in the streets, uh, metaphorically fighting. And I said, well, you know, I'm going to tell you the same thing I told them, the group that you're talking about that you cannot show me anything in Southwest Georgia that would suggest having two schools four miles apart has elevated the economic and educational well-being of this region of the state. In fact, we're at the bottom, not just in Georgia, but across the nation. We've had three census reviews last 30 years. We're in the top two quartiles of poverty. We have cancer, stroke, diabetes, and obesity that's epidemic. And you're telling me two institutions that ought to be rich repositories of knowledge should continue to fight. I said, I would never buy that. But Dr. Dunning, now you, I, 
then they got a little word about my my experience about when I you've been around the world and you've uh, you went to the University of Alabama, Doctor Dunning, do you understand us? And what was amusing to me about that question, you you Sheffield, you know where Marengo County is. You cannot grow up in Marengo County in the fifties and the sixties and not know what it means to understand issues of race. I didn't get into details with them about that. I said, I think so. I think I do understand. But I'm going to be driven by facts, data, and information, not passion, emotion, and anger. So if you, if you cannot deal with facts, data, and information, and evidence, then I'm probably not the best person to talk about this with you. Because I'm not going to buy what you're selling about what they're selling. I'm not joining their tribe. I'm not joining your tribe. I'm going to join the tribe of facts and information. That's what I'm going to do. So what I sensed in that community was this historic polarization that has been with us for so long that for the white members in that boardroom, they wondered whether or not I would change things and maybe to benefit them. And for the black members of the community, Dr. Dunn, are you sure you're black enough for us? Are you sure you, you, you know how to carry this torch and, and you know, wave the flag? And so for both groups, I had to assure them I'm going to play it straight down the middle on this one. I want to play it as, I, as I'm by experience, by temperament, and by my own biases, is to be honest and factual about what's going on. That's how I'm going to play it. And if you get mad about it, that's on you. You'll have to, you'll have to work through that on your own time. So it was a tough situation because everyone was looking for an advantage. <clears throat> what was interesting to me the chancellor decided to keep the name and the board, Albany State University. And Darton, we'd name one of the five colleges, the Darton College of the Health Professions, but the institution was Albany State. So I, saw, I said, so I'm not into winning and losing, but if you have the name and you have other assets that you can serve students, and by the way, now let me remind you what, why we're here. It's to serve the academic needs of students, not your feelings about football and band and all this other stuff and cheerleading. That's not why we're here. So if you cannot see the rationale that this will serve students better where they can navigate from an associate degree to a bachelor's to a master's and EDS, then you're in the wrong place with your thinking. And there's nothing you can do to change my thinking on that. And I often thought, would I, how would I have, I probably would have lost the job if I needed the job. But what, where I was, I had already retired. And I, I had a boss, and his name was Hank Huckabee, but I didn't have a boss. Because I could have said to Hank, he could have said to me, all right, I need for you to leave. And I could say, thank you. Or I could have said to Hank, Hank, I'm leaving. So I was not at a place professionally where I could be held hostage. And, had I, and I don't think had I needed the job, I would have changed what I did. So these, these wounds were so raw in that community. And what I've often felt, that benign neglect, that what I knew in the 80s, I knew both presidents down there very well. And I sat in a lot of budget meetings. And they both in veiled ways at times would say things that played out those community biases. And I, was, I felt one was, I feel superior and the other, I'm so tired of the other one trying to look down his nose at us. Both were having difficulty, but it was for different reasons. And so when I tried to navigate through that process, I knew my time would be to help to execute the process and do the consolidation, but I was not willing to give what I consider seven to nine more years to address some 350 year problems. They needed somebody to come in who could be energized, stay there and do that. But I left not exhausted physically and emotionally, but I left exhausted with the notion of, and that's why I chose the title of the book, Unreconciled. How can we make this issue 
better for us as a nation, given the composition demographically of who we are. How can we do this? Because it's going to be hard to manage the complexity of automation, technology, globalization, and change when we overlay that with race, ethnicity, and religion. How are we going, how are we going to do that? And if we have voices who are trying to get an upper hand by stoking the fires, politicians who are driving many of our citizens insane with this, it's going to be difficult to manage some of the complexity because it's complex without these issues. And if we have politicians who figure out that that's where our passions are, <clears throat> and that's what we'll vote for if you bring it up. That's what Wallace did. The people in Birmingham, Bull Connor, George Wallace and others, set that state back for a long time. And, Al and Atlanta is, is an imperfect place, all cities are. But they had Ivan Allen and, and Robert Woodruff and on for a long time, Ralph McGill. They were not any happy about civil rights in many parts of, of Atlanta, but they chose not to think it's okay to kill people. And Alabama took no prisoners. People blowing up churches, putting fire hoses on children and turning police dogs on and blowing up a church with children in it. It set that state and that nation, I mean, that uh, community back. I'll say one more thing about that is that when I was in uh, Taiwan, guys used to sit around and talk about where they're from. And I always was kind of a listener. The guy said, Art, where are you from? I said, Alabama. He said, man, you're going to stay with some crazy people down there. And they, they would name these folks. Um, what part of Alabama? Birmingham, Mobile, and Montgomery? I said, no, I grew up on a, in a farming area. He said, how in the world did you get through all that? So the sort of image and stereotype, and these are African-Americans asking these questions. It was this whole idea of um, the ability to live and to breathe freely and to be left alone. And that's when I was thinking about that experience in Taiwan. So the Albany experience brought all of that back. It brought it to the top in ways that I had not anticipated. And it shows me how deep feelings are down into our culture. Some with the superiority and others with, if you push me, I'm gonna get my legs in. I'm never taking this anymore. You, had your, you took your best shot with Jim Crow and you took your best shot with slavery. So if I hear you say anything in a meeting, that suggests Albany State is not a good place and not, uh, we don't do fine academic work. I'm gonna call your hand on this. So we always this sort of uh, historic tension and points of view about that. It came out in so many ways. Well, you're right about a lot of crazy people in Alabama because I'm descended from a lot of them. Um, and, uh, and I have a lot of relatives up there. But I've got some questions, in, in, including um, um, one from somebody in Alabama. It says, uh, your book enlightened me of my ignorance of understanding of what truly went on in my childhood with respect to repression among my black neighbors. Currently, currently, we see our country becoming more ignorant on so many levels. Do you agree? And if so, why do you think this is happening? Um, I have a perspective that as we've watched this demographic shift that is scaring a lot of people, people are becoming fearful, and that if you have a historic sort of uh, way to process information about other people, if you want to process how you think about other people, and if that way you think about it is that I have a hereditary advantage because of the color of my skin. I have uh, intellectually more assets and you have intellectually more deficits. And equality is not equality. Equality means a loss for me, not a gain for everybody. So I think this demographic change is causing a lot of 
people to get a little unnerved about it. And I wish we had a different way to talk about it because when, after I did my four years in the military, and I didn't know I would come out thinking this way, but I felt like I paid a lot of civic rent to this nation by those 48 months I gave to the United States Air Force and the United States of America. So I became a true believer about this nation after I did my military service, but also became a person who said, now don't bother me about my race anymore. L leave me alone. Let's... So I think we're seeing people who a feeling that I've had the upper hand since the beginning in 1619. And now this nation is shifting as I'm looking at it on a daily basis. What does that mean for our politics, our economics, our schools, our governance, our social issues? What does that mean? And what we are finding as Wallace did there are others who recognize how nervous some of our citizens are. Not only are they stoking the fires, they're accelerating divisions. And so King talked about brotherhood. If you read his letter from the Birmingham jail, he never sounded like he had animosity, but his, his speech, his writings all dealt with my Christian heritage and my brother and my neighbor. So he was saying, let's just, let's treat all of us, the content of our character. And he had no feelings about the upper hand and retribution. But what we are seeing now, if who are these people and let's build a wall so we can create keep this horde out and these folks who have uh, been here, let's limit their, a, their voice politically and through government. Let's limit their participation rather than saying that there's richness in all of us participating. And I mentioned this to someone recently. I was speaking with a group in Cameroon of professors and I ask the question, what did it feel like part of Cameroon colonized by the British and another part was colonized by the French? So they talked about that for an hour. And they said, then they looked at me and said, Dr. Dunning, uh, what makes the U.S. unique? I said, orderly transfer of power and the rule of law. It never failed. Every time I've been asked that, that's the first thing I'd say. And it appears that so many people are afraid of this change in this demographic rather than making everybody true believers in some fashion like i was when i came out of service my approach is to go back to the 60s and uh, 1800s to deny you to shut you out to keep you under the thumb so as i think about how we do this how do you do it? Is it community by community? Is it if people have become so fearful and we are in a very sophisticated technology environment with social media, which means you can be meaner, faster, and quicker. You can put a lie out there. You can say anything that's not true and get people all stirred up. So if we're gonna navigate our way out of this complexity uh, we, have a nation, we are a nation with five or six world religions represented. We are a nation with almost any race in the world. We have it in the United States of America, different ethnic groups. And yet there's this American idea. We all created it equal. So what is it that we can do that can address the fact that we need to empower everybody so they can own these communities, own our states, in ways where they feel the same ownership and that I felt, and, and I'm, I think about how did I arrive at this? One was a, a, a stern talk. It really was a signal event for me and, and the way I was parented by my mother and father is to feel 
this transformation of ownership as a citizen of a, of a great democracy. And yet we're seeing people right in front of us ready to give up the rule of law and ready to give up orderly transfer of power. It is something I thought I would never see in my lifetime. That's what it appears to be when I hear some of the speeches that I'm hearing on TV now and hearing some of the actions that people are taking. We're ready to give it up. And there are people around the world who fought and died. We had people in this country who fought and died for an open democracy. And now something is happening. And how it happens in an environment where we have access to information at the tip of our hands, and yet we seem to have lost the ability to analyze, synthesize, and to think. So it may be, it comes back to leadership. It comes back, I used the Birmingham and Atlanta example. The consequences of that leadership style in Atlanta versus Birmingham had generational consequences, had generational consequences. And the two cities are not even remotely close. So, there are things happening that seeds are being planted. And that's why I use the 1963, that when that was a tipping point year, that when people started to feel empowered. And I'll say one more thing, Sheffield, is that I've been in a lot of meetings, not just in Albany, but throughout my time in higher education, is that you could hear in a meeting some of these deep passions to come out on both sides. And Someone will say something, I'll use the University of Alabama, the University of Georgia. Someone may say at the table, well, you know, we need diversity, but now does that mean the quality might go down? If we invite more uh, Latinos and Asians, and Hispanics and African-Americans, um, don't you think we need to be worried a little bit more about quality, not just numbers? And someone who's sitting in there who, and I said this one time at a meeting at the University of Georgia, I said, you know, for me, diversity is not a synonym for deficit. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people of any group who are academically prepared to survive in a, in a high achieving environment, in a high performing environment. But there was this perspective that if you talk about diversity, that means you're getting less than rather than and you're subtracting, not adding. So we're at a place where I think now we're all struggling at least I am. Some of you may have figured it out and know what we need to do. I don't. Um, because I've seen so much in my lifetime and know how deep, deep some of these fault lines are and how skilled, and I saw one of the best in the world, how skilled demagogues can be. And Wallace was one. In Alabama, you know, it's my home state. It's a state where I came of age. It's a state where my mother and father spent decades teaching it's a state where I own land. It's a state where I love the people I grew up around. But it's, it's not a place where, where I felt about it like some of my colleagues in the military who thought I came from purgatory. You came from Southwest Alabama. Art, where in the hell is that? How'd you get out of there? Well, I told them I had a good time. You know, even with Jim Cross, yeah, I grew up in a warm family and a warm community. So, that's more than you want to hear about it, but that's, that's sort of the challenges I think we're facing right now. Well, I think a lot of what you say in, a lot of what you say in the book lays a lot of groundwork for maybe some ways forward. Um, but I'm going to end, end, end the, um, with um, a, a question from Mary Frances Early, the first black graduate of the University of Georgia. Um, who spoke earlier today. And uh, her question is Dr. Dunning, how were you treated at the University of Alabama when you were a student? Um, I talk about this in the book. <clears throat> when I went to the university, I, had, I was discharged on a Friday. Went home to see my mom and dad um, Saturday and Sunday. And Sunday, I checked into the residence hall. And just being out of the military two days, I was still making beds and tightening the bed and lining my shoes up under the bed like I was in a barracks. Um, I walked across campus on Monday going to this bookstore and a person yelled out 
a building and use the racial slur and use the N word and say, go home. And what? And I walked on showing no emotion because I had been away from the country for two years before my time at Maxwell in Taiwan. And in a perverse way, his use of the racial slur let me know I was truly was back at home, uh, that I was interfering and intruding. I was not invited to the University of Alabama campus. But I walked on showing no emotion about that because I knew Alabama was a party that I had not been invited to, but I was going to go anyway. And when I got there, I was going to have a good time. So I walked on. And Monday, after I registered, the classes, I think, started on Thursday. And one of the buildings in the arts and sciences complex at the University of Alabama, the first class I walked into was, uh, I think, a class in anthropology or political science. I can't remember which but it must have been 30 students in there. I walked in and sat down, and about 10 students got up and walked out. And they dropped the class. And I was 22 years old at the time on the GI Bill. And so I was kind of a, you know, I had heard some pretty raw language in the barracks and had been all over, overseas. I was finding things like that amusing in a, in a, in a sense that, I use this in the book. I didn't care whether you were from Utah, Alabama, which is one of the poorest zip codes in Alabama, or Mountain Brook, one of the wealthiest zip codes. I don't care where you're from, but I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. So the treatment was almost how some religious sects function, shunning that uh, we wish you would go away. And so some students would get off the sidewalk when you would pass by. Others, as I mentioned, get up and out of the classroom and walk out. And if you sat down with a group of students in the dining hall, one time I went in the dining hall and sat down at a table on the end with about six, eight white guys. They got, they all got their trays got up and moved. And I wasn't sitting by them. I was sitting on the end of the table. So this notion of what I call purity versus pollution. Anytime you drink out a water fountain that says, white, you polluted it. If you are sitting in the white section, you polluted it. If you're sitting by me in the University of Alabama residence hall, you polluted it. So there was no violence. Vivian Malone and others had been 36 months earlier, had sort of calmed down the sort of overt things. I came there at the time. She was there in 60, 63, I was there in 66. There were no more than eight or 10 students there, African-American. So mine was heavily shunning and you're not invited. And, and I'll finish with this one comment. I went to a homecoming parade and there were three or four African-American students. We watched the parades as they went by. And one float came by with a woman, I mean, with six, five or six women with antebellum dresses on and five or six guys with Confederate uniforms and muskets. They had hired some local African-American kids, 12 and 13 years of age, get on that float while the women were sitting and these 12 were fanning them with little fans. And so I looked at that and thought, okay, that doesn't seem to make any sense. Uh, so we went to see the president, President Frank Rose. And we told him, uh, Dr. Rose, Southern history is kind of interesting. We have a view of Southern history and I'm sure these folks who are trying to expose their point of view on Southern history, but they don't mesh very well. And I'm not sure what you can do about it, Mr. President, but we would not like to have young black boys fanning undergraduate students on a float with antebellum dresses on. Could you help us with that, Mr. President? And he has sort of a patrician bearing about him. And uh, he said, well, I'll see what I can do about it. We didn't hear back from him, but we didn't see that float anymore. And what was so interesting to me about that is and in response to that question is almost everything that happened on that campus in my first two years was to suggest in almost every way cre creative, any way possible that you could be creative and innovative to say, you are not welcome, you are in my space. 
you don't deserve to be here. And this was three years after Vivian Malone and James Hood had entered the campus. So when I went back there uh, as the vice chancellor on international programs and outreach, and you mentioned this in the introduction, I was one of the five African-American walk-ons on the football team in 1967. Because one of the play, I mean, one of the coaches said he never could see the day when a African American could play football at Alabama. They just didn't have the intellectual capacity nor the athletic ability to play football at Alabama. So when I go back now and watch Alabama's football team, it looks very different than what I saw then. I almost had a view of the future about what was coming, and I think part of it was living abroad. I saw this sort of groundswell of change. And now it's accelerating and we seem to be as a nation struggling with struggling with something I thought had been resolved. But no, it was not a welcoming place. It was not a place of uh, kindness and generosity and compassion and restraint. It would say, you don't deserve to be here. And I was there after having served my nation two years on the foreign soil. You still don't deserve to be here. So I'll stop at that point, Shelby. All I can say is this has been, you know, been fabulous. And, and this really is a transformative book. You've just gotten a glimpse into, uh, into it tonight. And um, if I can get Claire back on, she can tell us how, to, how we can all buy the book. Of course. And thank you so much, Art, for the time and just, and for the book, you know, I know that took a lot to put into it. If you were interested in tonight's conversation, there's so much more in the book that we just didn't have the time to even scratch the surface of, in particular, so much more about the, the consolidation with Albany State and Darton State College. So you can purchase the book from Atlanta History Center's museum store. There'll be a link to do that in the chat. Uh, we offer domestic U.S. shipping and in-store pickup if you're in the Atlanta area. And again, to all of you who joined us, um, to Art and to Sheffield and to all of the guests that we've had yesterday and today, thank you for being a part of our commemoration of Martin Luther King Day. It's been just two days of just so much, just invigorating conversation and idea sharing. And just, it's just been wonderful. So I really appreciate you both. Um, appreciate everyone in the audience this afternoon. And I hope that everyone has a safe and wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.